42. Uh, and, and we're live. You, you know I can't count that high. What are you doing? It's rude. 42,000. 42, like the number of people at Dragon Con? 42,000, yes. No, no, just 42. <laughs> no. It's a tiny little convention. I, I hear it's growing. Hey, stop dropping off the scientific notation. All right. So, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, first let me say, Nick is alive. We have proof of life of our co-host. Uh, he has not been commenting as much on Facebook because he got banned, probably for making fun of somebody again. And uh, the border has kept him very busy. Um, I'm sure he's policing all the popsicle stands and doing all those things. Wait, I thought but, he was uh, gone because of um, what's it called? That fan art thingy. That also might be what he's doing. Drawing. I hope. You know, he's got to got to feed that kid. All right. So first, let me introduce our guest. So uh, J. Daniel Sawyer, can you introduce yourself to anyone who doesn't know who you are? Oh, I. Uh... Hi, I'm Jay Daniel Sawyer. I'm the host of the Everyday Novelist podcast, a uh, multiple award nominated host of, or, and producer of Down from 10, The Antithesis Progression, Sculpting God, The Polyschismatic Reprobate Tower. I've got about 30 books to my credit. Uh, it's actually more than that, but not all of them are out yet. Um, and I'm currently running a Kickstarter for my book, The Secrets of the Heinlein Juvenile, which is the first ever book to take an in depth look at what. Heinlein did to construct the formula and the literary form that his Heinlein juveniles wound up taking. Okay, got that question out of the way early. Um, so as you notice, we have somebody else in the square. Well, you can't notice that because we're doing this audio only. So we've got as a special co-host, uh, Mr. Joe Vasicek. I hope I pronounced that right. That's correct. Vasicek like cash a check. Outstanding. So uh, can you introduce <laughs> yourself to the audience? Yes, my name is Joe Vasicek. I write uh, science fiction and fantasy. I've got, yeah, probably about 30 titles out now. And uh, yeah, most of them are uh, independently published and uh, a few short stories out there too. And uh, yeah. So I am such a slacker because I have like less than that. <laughs> well, Why? I do have a lot of short stories out. You so. got to start a long way after we did, man. <laughs> this is true. I, I haven't counted recently, so I, it's, it's some. But um, all right, Doc, you get to ask uh, them the uh, religion question. And since you're a special co-host, we're going to make you answer too, Joe, after, after Dan. All right. Yes, that's because Jared wasn't sure if I'd still be alive after Dragon Con. So, Ender's Game, <laughs> E.T. or Treasure Planet? Which one's your religion? Sorry. I'm, <laughs> maybe I might still be on Dragon Time. Wow, the options have changed. Am I asking this first or is uh, Daniel's answer good? Oh, uh, we were going to let Dan answer his first, and uh, we, we mix it up now just to I stop don't... it from being formulaic. Yeah, I was about to say, did I enter a parallel universe where, like, the, the two main religions yes. were yes, gone? You, did. We're you might have. You never know. It might be a better universe. I don't know. I went t dancing with T-Rexes. You never know, man. Well, if it's a pocket universe or a parallel universe, I want pineapple on pizza to be outlawed. Pineapple I just want to enter a parallel universe where Star Wars is in the public domain. It's even better when you get salty bacon on it. Oh, so good. Bacon on pizza is acceptable. Adding pineapple is a bridge too far. But we asked Dan a question, so we're going to let him answer. It's not that religion. Oh, if I have to choose between those three, I'd say E.T., but I'd be prone to be a heretic in general. I well, if you that. notice, the theme was coming-of-age stories. See what I did there? Ah, ah, good point. Good point, yeah. All right, so if you had to pick between those three, Joe, which would it be? What were the three again? There's E.T. E.T., Ender's Game, and Treasure's Planet. Uh, I'd have to say Treasure's Planet was a, was a pretty trippy movie, but I'd have to say Ender's Game, uh, the book. That book. I checked that out from the library when I was a kid. I read like the first 10 pages. And was like, okay, let's take this home. And then I basically, after dinner, just straight read the whole thing through until like 3 a.m. And every time I was like, I was like, okay, at the end of this chapter, I'll put it down and go to bed. And then it's like, no, I have to read the next chapter. Just the next chapter. And then I got to the very ending, and then it was just like, oh, mind explode. It was, it, was, it was a good book. It was a good time. Nice. Good answer. All right, Doc. Okay. So the fantasy religion. Journey to, center, to the center of the earth. Gods of Egypt or the mummy? 
oh, it's got to be Journey to the Center of the Earth. The Mummy is great. I haven't seen Gods of Egypt, but Journey to the Center of the Earth is just fantastic. Every iteration I've seen, even the really dorky ones, are loads and loads of fun. So, so where does Gods Have of Space Mute Will Travel fit in here? <laughs> I don't think it does. I, it's a, it's a like whole it? thing. Yeah, it, it could be. He does face down the gods at the end. So, so yeah. So I got of, nine line juveniles. So Gods of Egypt is a really trippy uh, B movie, um, sort of. And uh, the, it, it's about adults, but they're sort of forced to grow up. And the same with The Mummy. I mean, Brendan Fraser sort of has to become an adult by the end. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though he started as an adult, he was just an immature. So I'm not quite sure if that comes as coming of age, but I well, couldn't find and, any and, and, uh, of Ra Rachel Weiss's character also grows up over the course of it as well. So, um, yeah. So that that's tr the theme I tried to go for, but, you know, it was easier to do it with the first set. Hmm. All right. What about you, Joe? Uh, I think I... I watched. I started like the first half of the Mummy, and then I just kind of stopped watching it because I thought it was stupid. And I haven't heard of the. <laughs> <laughs> and then I haven't actually seen any version of the Dream Center Earth, but I did read, I think, a graphic novelization of it, and I thought that was pretty good. So, and I know it's also, it's also a Jules Verne novel, but I, I haven't read that one. I have read um, Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. I was about to ask you about the Jules Verne novel because I've read that as well. Yeah. When possible, we yes. try to pick movies that also were books, so that way, you know, people that get their pop culture in whatever way for these questions, it still works. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, in that case, have you read the original Bram Stoker version of The Mummy? I did no. not know it was a Bram Stoker version. No. <laughs> yeah, Bram wow. Stoker wrote the story upon which the Boris Karloff movie was based, and then the Brendan Fraser one was a remake of the Boris Karloff one. Huh. I knew Fun it was a book. book. Really, I didn't realize really, really the author twisted. Was. Interesting. Okay. So, what was your first love, sci fi or fantasy? Ooh. Um, that's hard because I, um, the same year, I fell in love with Star Wars, Star Trek, Secret of Nim, and. Um, Oh, and Lord of the Rings, all in the same year. And that I was, was like forced. I don't remember which came first. That was a very good year. Yeah, I'm glad. I was getting really excited. I thought you were going to say Lord of the Flies for a second. <laughs> Nobody loved Lord no, no. of the Flies, JR. It's I was a very troubled book. teenager and I loved it. You are so, <laughs> Thank you. so wrong. <laughs> All right, so when I, was, listen I to actually this, just, just I actually just did a TikTok about Lord of the Flies and how it inspired Tunnel in the Sky. Mm. That's interesting. And so anybody that loves Lord of the Flies, comment in the on the podcast where we post it uh, anywhere just to tell <laughs> Saskia she's wrong. And if you think I'm wrong, you could I mean, keep your opinion to yourself. I mean, you're not wrong, Saskia. I hate it wrong. now. But when I was a high school kid, I loved it. So I don't know. Yeah, I loved it in I high school. It. I liked yeah, The no. Wave. That was a good one. So what about you, Joe? Was your first was love sci-fi or fantasy? Well, it's hard because because Star Wars is both. But um, I have to say probably... <laughs> But I'd probably have to say uh, science fiction, yeah, because it was it was really Star Wars that really got the bug for me. But right after that, I read uh, the Never Ending Story, which is actually my favorite, oh, uh, still my favorite novel wonderful. of all time. Really good book. I cried so many really years watching book. that movie. So many <laughs> it was yeah, a good the book. Movie. Gets was... super dark after oh, after the movie ends. The book continues for a while, and it gets super dark for a patch. It's really good. You don't yeah. see. You don't realize until you finish, until the very end of the book, and until you're actually an adult rereading it, that the book is actually about how the power of, of fantasy stories and, and fiction in general to save people from the dark demons in their lives. And you realize that the, what the story is really about is about mm -hmm. Bastion saving his father from the depression after his, after his mother dies. And so, after Bastion's mother dies, his, his father's wife. And so, um, and him going to the uh, through the, his old adventures in Fantastica gives him what he needs to actually do that. So, okay, really I did stuff. not know that. It's been a while since I've watched it. But yeah. I, it's I not you got to read the book. The movie, the, the movie book. is just an '80s corn. It's just an '80s corn fest. Yeah. But like, and it's and fun. Plot wise, it only covers like the first third of the book, too, if I remember right. That's true. It like ends like in chapter end. There's enough 
plot in that movie that I think it's okay that it doesn't cover everything because I'd yes. rather have oh, it yeah. not cover everything than try and smash everything in. Well, the movie is a totally separate oh, a great movie. from the book. Um, yeah. It's like, just to look at it as a totally different Now, I did watch the thing. sequels, and the second one was kind of dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the sequels sucked, too. So uh, You know what? Just... I had a huge crush on Jonathan Brandis at the time. And Jonathan Brandis, sequel, right? <laughs> so it did not matter how much it sucked. Really. Every <laughs> girl in my junior high was like, oh, I love Jonathan Brandis. I'm like, yeah, but he can't act. <laughs> I did not care. I did not care at all. They didn't all. love him for his acting. Um, I know. know. Okay. Better than Wesley Crusher. It was Crusher. the dreamy blue eyes. Better than Wesley Crusher. <laughs> so, yes, shut up, Wesley. Um, the, uh, the the funny one was Doc likes to, to tease people that, you know, don't go to cons and stuff. But there's this picture of someone doing a uh, cosplay uh, at Dragon Con of the guy pulling yes. the horse out of the mud. The Marriott carpet. With the Marriott carpet because it blended in. Nice. The they did it. That was kind of cool. All right. So he, uh, you know what? That cosplayer has gotten people to cry. I get it. I wasn't ready for that when you showed it to me. I know. You're so not ready for so many things. So uh, what was your first <laughs> memory of engaging in speculative fiction? Was it watching it on television, reading a specific book, like you mentioned, or did you just discover it in some other way? Dan? Um, I, well, I had, uh, I had a little, um, those little eight inch children's records with the uh, storybook uh, that went with them for the, um, da, 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 the rank and bass version of the Hobbit and for the empire strikes back. And so that's my first memory of uh, genre fic at all. Okay. And I what listened to them until the records wore out. I remember getting cassette tapes at McDonald's and the happy meals. If you paid a little extra and it was them, somebody reading a story. Like a Cliff Cliff Notes version, mm -hmm. but yep. What about you, Joe? Same kind of same kind of deal, yeah. You know, I'm sure that I had interactions with speculative fiction long before this. Well, actually, no, no. Actually, now that now that I think, there was a children's book that my dad had, and I don't remember the title of it, but I remember the pictures. It was like an old '40s or '50s era picture book, and it had one of those. It was basically like how we're going to go to the moon, and how like like the rocket ship taking off and it had one of those space stations that's like spinning around early and children's like, literature is basically all spec fic in my opinion pretty much i mean have you read yeah. even something like right. um i love you to, to fairy tales. Back. oh yeah like, yeah don't even get me started nickelodeon on nickelodeon because that is all <laughs> yep all You're fantasy about about two, yeah, the two rabbits where they're like yeah. tell me how much i love you you know uh -huh. like, yes i read it to my daughter every night but um, there's like, but this, this, this one was specifically like, I think it was like from the space race. Like, I think it was actually written in the beginning of the space race because it had like wow. almost like a Saturn V rocket taking off and it had like the thing. It was like, it was a picture so book cool. that my dad, my dad had when he was a kid, I think. And then he was reading it to me. And I think that was my first time thinking, wow, we could go to space. We could go to the moon. And so, and it's reading, uh, years later, I read, um, what was it? The... The one, the I think it was yeah, Farmer in the Sky, one of those Highland juveniles. Yes. And I was like, mm -hmm. very much getting vibes of, oh wow, this is like early space race, space race type stuff. So getting that, that kind of feel for it. Okay, so uh, Dan, what is it you love about speculative fiction as a genre? Oh. God, I don't know. It gets you that young and that deeply. It's hard. It's sort of like the water you swim in. Um, I suppose I love the uh, aside from just the mythic resonance, which is amazing. I love the uh, the way it gives you an alternate vocabulary to ex to break up in in real life. Everything gets packaged into um, um, into units. It's very hard to deal with anything interesting or difficult, even in fiction, where you don't wind up either directly uh, recapitulating the dominant narrative of your culture or deliberately subverting it in order to get attention. And SpecFit lets you break those packages open and look at the pieces in a different context aside from each other. And whether you're talking about the kind of stuff you get in kids' books about um, being courageous in a Boy Scout troop on the moon or something, or whether it's uh, something quite... Uh, dark and complex like dune it 
reassembles all of human experience into um, a different configuration than we normally experience it. And it gives, I think it gives, it gives me at least a sense, the same kind of sense of connection to the whole line of humanity that reading deep history does. Okay. What about you, Joe? You know, I have this theory that uh, speculative fiction, it's one of those genres that really gets people uh, a lot more, a lot more than in, in other certain other genre fiction or literary fiction most of the time too. It's because like in, yeah. in other genre fiction, like the setting is what grounds you. It'll be like, it might be exotic. It'll be like Paris or it'll be like Morocco or it'll be like somewhere else, but it'll be like a real world place. But then the people are like larger than life. So you'll have like an ex Navy seal or a, this person, you know, or something else. Um, or it'll be like a Fabio or something. If it's like, I don't know. But then, and then literary fiction is just all a lot of navel gazing, which gets kind of, you know, just how real people are anyways. <laughs> but then you get to, uh, with science fiction and fantasy, with speculative fiction, <clears throat> the thing that's crazy and wild is, is the setting because it's got that sense of wonder. And so you have this, you'll be like far off in the future or you'll be like out in space or you'll be like in a fantasy world, uh, in a secondary world fantasy or even a, a portal fantasy. And so to ground the reader, to keep them from thinking, oh, this is totally unbelievable, it has to really get people right. So the characters are acting like real people. They feel like real people that you can actually be with that you can go on a journey with. And I think that's one thing that's really drawn me. I think there, there are other genres that probably do it too. I think historical fiction can do it too when it's done well. But spec fic especially um, really, I think, gets, um, when it's done right, really gets um, you really into a character's head and re really feels like a real person and helps you to, and it helps you to understand real people in your own life too, which is... Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely a case of speculative fiction. I think is so important because it shows us that we're all really just humans, no matter what we look like or how we choose to label ourselves and specify. We're all just humans with it, and it's easier to talk about social change when it, you're not you're taking it out of a setting that's familiar. So. I love speculative fiction for that reason. It's so much fun. Yeah, and I think reason. it also makes it much easier for kids, which is what we're talking about today, right? Indeed. So how did your love of speculative fiction transition into you writing stories in that space? Dan? Or about writing that space. <laughs> true, true. Um, well, the about came later. The uh, how did it translate to writing in? I um, the night I finished Lord of the Rings, we went. To, my family went to dinner at the house of a family friend who was the archaeology professor at the college where my dad taught, and I was all proud that at eight years old I'd read Lord of the Rings. So I was bragging, and he was he spotted an opportunity to get rid of the annoying kid. So he said, "You know, I'm working on a fantasy novel," and I said, "Really?" Because up to that moment, writing books was something that the gods did. And now here was someone I knew who was writing a book and it wasn't a scholarly thing. And so I said, I've got to read it. And he said, I thought you'd say that. <laughs> so I spent the night sequestered in his office, reading through his manuscript. And I got to the end of it and I said, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And I stole a legal pad and started writing my first novel on it. Oh, nice. Precocious. I can dig it. So I have this theory that kids, uh, there's a, the reputation that kids of preachers have that that equally applies to kids of college professors. Because everyone I've met has been a little bit off. <laughs> Not always in a bad way off, well, my, but just a little bit off. My father was both. So. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That explains everything. That's Joe. a lot of yep. mistakes to fill up. Joe, yep. Joe's trying to be well, nice. I'm doing my best. On that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I do my got, best to do my worst. Absolutely. We appreciate I that like about this you. guy. He can stay. <laughs> so how did you transition from loving speculative fiction to writing your own stories, Joe? You know, it's kind of hard. Like when I was, when I was eight years old, I read um, right before, I think it's like the year before I read um, The Never Ending Story. And it was probably around the same time I watched Star Wars for the first time. I read uh, Madeline Lingle's Wrinkle in Time. And for some reason, mm. really caught, like the stuff about the test racks and the multidimensional stuff really caught my mind. And I was thinking about it, and and I just kind of got this sense that like, this this impression, like, no, you're going to be a writer someday. Like, you're gonna you're gonna write this kind of stuff. And I was like, I was already making up stories with like my Legos and stuff like that, and you know, other little toys, and you know, making up old worlds and things like that. And um, 
whenever I really liked the story, I liked it. it's kind of a fan fiction urge. I never really wrote a lot of fan fiction, but I kind of made up a lot of it in my head, especially when I was younger. But um, it was something clicked when I was eight years old, and I was like, you're going to be a writer someday. And immediately I was like, oh, I better not do that for a living because adults always hate what they do for a living. I don't want to ever hate writing. So, <laughs> and then I, then I took uh, Brandon Sanderson's writing class at, uh, in college, and that disabused me of that notion and also made me realize, look, if I'm going to do something, you know, I, I want it for a career. I want to do something that I, that I love doing. And, and so I'm like, I'm going to give this a shot. Um, I, I, was, I, wrote my, I, fin I wrote started a lot of novels in high school, but I never finished one until college. And that was, that was that class. I took the class again the next year. Um, but then, uh, and I think I audited it, but uh, it wasn't like after I graduated, I was kind of in a situation where it's like, well, it's the middle of the recession. You know, I can, I can work odd jobs until I find a day job or I can work odd jobs until I get, start getting published and you start, you know, and then indie publishing was becoming a thing at the time. And so it's like, you know, why don't I want to get this a shot? Why don't I get this a try? So that's, uh, I jumped into self-publishing and started really uh, learning the ropes and started uh, making it work and happen it happen. And so far it seems to have, uh, it seems to be working out. So I am. And you don't hate what you do for a living, right? Just to make sure. I, <laughs> well, there are certain things that I hate about it. <laughs> But for sure, there are certain things that are more of a slog than others. Uh, but I love the writing part, and I love the I love the I love the um, coming up with stories, writing them out. Sometimes it can be a little bit challenging. Sometimes it can be a little hard to you get blocks and you're trying to push through and everything. But no, I I love writing. I love creating stories. And I love putting them out in the world. It's great. That's a good answer. All right, Doc. The next question is yours. Uh, one second. I'm sorry, I'm rusty. Oh, okay. So do you have any real life experiences that have really formed who you are as a storyteller? I obviously should have read the uh, the question list more carefully. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that one. Oh, uh -oh. oh God, yeah. Endless, endless ones. But um, oh, let's see. I think... I moved uh, when I was seven years old. I moved from Dallas to San Francisco and a complete world shifted every possible way. Yeah, it was the early 80s. And it unsettled me in exactly the way that, in retrospect, many of my characters are often unsettled at the beginning of their stories. Um, I think there's an emotional, um, an emotional cord there that has never quite been unplucked that okay. uh, that shows up all through um the other thing actually the other thing, the one that had a really big effect on my writing was um when i was 10 years old i was privy to a blackmail murder cover-up oh. and um, oh that's yeah, a heavy I, step I, I actually world. yeah i actually i actually fictionalized it and put it in my uh my mystery novel blood and weeds uh, heavily fictionalized so that no one can sue me but um it was fascinating being, I was just the right age to sort of sneak into the rooms where the adults were talking about what they, what they should do with this information and not be noticed. And so I got to hear everything. And it made me fascinated with the uh, way that uh, conspiracies work, the way that people um, deal, with, uh, deal with what happens when an institution that they care about turns septic or is revealed to have been septic. And so the kind of um, the kind of interpersonal politics that I saw on display really shaped the way that I have uh, written interpersonal politics in my books ever since I've been writing. Neat. Okay. That's... I feel like you need to go read this book. Hmm. Okay, that's deep. All right, Joe, can you follow that one up? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, 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 I was actually the murderer in that murder. plot for hire. Yeah, I never, never, haven't, haven't murdered anybody yet, um, but or or involved in any kind of like that plot um, that I'm willing to admit. But uh, what, was the, what was the question again? Have you uh, had any formidable life experiences that shape you as a storyteller? Well, see, the funny thing is that like, kind of all of your life experiences are formative. There was that one class you yeah. took in college that he took again. Yeah. Again. Well, there's, I mean, that, that was helpful. Um, but I think as far as like having something to say and um, 
other experiences. I had a lot of uh, traveling abroad experiences. Like I, I studied Arabic in college, um, spent a summer studying in the Middle East and also kind of traveling around there, uh, mostly in Jordan, but also in Israel and uh, Egypt. Cause that was kind of, that was interesting. Uh, that definitely had an, an, an influence in a lot of my stuff, especially some of my earlier stuff. Um, I also, after I graduated, I, I took a year and uh, volunteer taught English in uh, the Caucasus Mountains. So I was up in uh, in Georgia, the country of Georgia, former uh, former Soviet wow. Republic, and they put me in um, they put me close to this they put me out in the western part. Um, so I was I was out in a, for a while. I was out there in a village. Um, it wasn't super remote. It wasn't like one of these places that still practices pagan religions, which there are a few of those still out there. But uh, it was and there was another guy I knew who um, oh, we had a long story how he was like taking the bus back to the capital and he. And going back, he ended up getting like snowed in and had to like tr like plunge through the snow like up to his chest. And he ended up spending five days in an old, rundown Soviet, you know, broken Soviet laboratory with the caretaker. They were just snowed in for five days together. He didn't speak English, and he didn't. The other guy didn't speak like the other guy didn't speak English, and he didn't speak Russian. So they were just kind of there for like a few days. I didn't have anything quite that extreme, although I did. We did kind of hitchhike a lot, and also hiked into some pretty remote places. Um, but that, that influenced a lot of my fantasy stuff, actually, kind of being up there in the mountains and seeing parts of the world that haven't, uh, they've only kind of barely touched the modern world. So that's, that's been interesting. How did you get an Arabic degree at the era that you did and not get snatched up by the <laughs> state department? Oh, there were, there were people trying to snatch me up. Um, so <laughs> that's also, this is another thing that also influenced my writing. I, uh, I was in a case read internship for a while. And uh, got fired because I wouldn't. Well, I got I got fired from it with three weeks to go, and so that so that kind of really turned me off anything having to do with government or um, Washington D.C. So yeah, and that was okay. uh, that did that did that did influence, did influence a few things that's for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I saw how the sausage was made, and I saw. Funny enough, it was actually it was the military people that I had the most respect for um, in D.C. And strangely, the politicians, not the the one, the main ones that you hear about, but the ones who are like lower, like lower down in the party structure, who are basically just just working in call centers all day when they're not like talking to think tanks, because like the guys on high tell them how to vote and they have to vote that way, otherwise they get primaried. So those guys actually seem pretty honest. Um, everybody else is a scumbag, complete and utter scumbag. Can't disagree with that. Yeah. All right. But uh, Doc, you better save me, or because once I start talking political, they're going to ban us from the air. You're not allowed yeah. to talk political because you just sound silly. Yeah. Uh, so, what is the weirdest interaction or funniest interaction you've ever had with a fan? Oh well, there's this guy named Jr. You know, and then that's yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. funniest interaction. I just recently sent out a published a short story, and uh, I got a email back like every once in a while like i've got a couple fans will email me back and say love the story here are all the typos and be like oh my gosh here we go i gotta fix some of those oh so my so. mother <laughs> <laughs> oh my mother gave me a three-star review on one of my books i'm good oh, with wow <laughs> <laughs> She's like, i don't really like this isn't what i usually read but the author is my son and wow then, <laughs> i'm surprised amazon actually lets them keep that up oh, that's good reads it was, it was just a three stars oh. whatever it doesn't really but it was uh, it was just kind of funny. Yeah, like, oh, that's, that's cold funny. though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did she, did she mention like something about twelve hours of labor? She mentioned that she didn't like the sexual content okay. in it, and so that was Dude, kind twelve of hours of labor is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I think my wife had thirteen for her first baby. I was a non-progressive for labor for four days. Oh, oh, and I get told I get asked once a year, "How long are you going to hold that against your kid?" And I went. <laughs> So my kid has an has one for four days. Oh gosh! And as my kid is not female, forever. Wow. <laughs> All right, fair enough. What about you? Uh, what about you, uh, Dan? Oh, I was at another author's uh, event, and I heard from across the room, "Oh my God, it's Dan Sawyer!" And I turned around just in time to catch a flying woman who was jumping, leaping over people to hug me. And it turned out to be another podcast. It turned out to be another podcaster who I didn't even know knew I existed, but I was a big fan of. 
That's awesome. <laughs> so it was that was a it was a good day. Made a friend. Friends are good. <laughs> I, it saved her, it sounds like. I'm glad you <laughs> caught her because otherwise you drop so she, her. She was just... certainly banking on the fact that I would turn around in time to catch her instead of letting her kill both of us. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I mean, wow. okay. you know. Well, if she had slammed into you from behind, she, you still would have broken her fall. I mean, you'd have been SOL. Yeah, but she, she yeah I would have broken her. my everything. So, <laughs> um, aside from kamikaze fan attacks, have you ever spotted somebody reading one of your books out in the wild? Yeah, and it was terribly anticlimactic. I spotted someone, I, I was at a bookstore and someone had one of my books and they were reading it on the thing and they had a receipt and they bought it. And I was all excited because I was actually at the bookstore to deliver another order of books. And um, I took a picture so that I, you know, not, not rudely, just sneakily took a picture so I could record the moment. And I showed my brother and he started laughing. And I said, what? And he called his daughter in. And he said, look at this. And she's like, oh, my girlfriend was there when you were. <laughs> so it was my niece's girlfriend who I hadn't met yet. Was there reading my books because they were written by her girlfriend's uncle. Oh, so she was doing recon. I can appreciate that. I appreciate it. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I can appreciate that. So um, what about you, Joe? Have you ever spotted anybody out in public reading your books? I uh, let me think. I don't generally get out in public. I can anymore. appreciate that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I mean, I have a baby now, so not real. No, I don't know. You're never There's, going anywhere uh, again. <laughs> I know pretty much. We go to the, we go to the grocery store sometimes. Hey, um, that's exciting when you have a baby. I went to Costco today. Yeah, no, the Ooh. baby was at home when I was doing that. Yeah, but it, I, I just grabbed. <laughs> no, uh, I think. I can't remember any time. I think I have once or twice, but I don't. If I will, maybe not. Maybe because if I if I did, I would have remembered it. I think a lot more. But uh, yeah, so I don't think so. Okay, so this would normally be the part of the interview where we'd have Dan tell us everything he's written, but he did that in his introduction. So instead, I'm going to ask you this, Dan: What of everything you've written is the, <laughs> your favorite of everything you've written? Oh God! You make it's like making you choose between your children, even when you can do it. It's not polite. Oh. Um, <laughs> okay, I was going to say because you, you do sometimes have a favorite. Now that favorite might switch based on which one's misbehaving. But that's right. My mom um, used to tell me it was just when everyone was leaving her alone almost. That's fair. Uh, it's it's going to have to at the moment. It's going to have to be a three way tie between the Suave Rob series, uh, down from ten and the new Heinlein Juvenile I have coming out later this fall, The Wolf of Venus. All three so, of them, every time I read them, I'm like, just, it, it feels like I've, I've discovered something new about myself that I didn't know I was, that, that was even there, let alone that I was putting in a book. And so, so they make me happy. So I do like, uh, for, for all of those three that you pick, I like Suave Rob the most. I especially like the narrator because you had um, Dave Robinson. Do the <laughs> Dave Robinson, he did such a great job. And I don't think after it's you actually that, it, yeah, I don't think anyone else could do that. No, it's actually his fault that there's three of them instead of one. Because I had written it as a one-off. And then he, uh, Escape Artists bought it, and he read it for Escape Artists. And I loved his reading so much that I wrote two sequels just so I could hire him to narrate them. <laughs> I can appreciate that. I, and he, right. he just did an amazing job. So if you want to know everything Joe has written, you're going to stay tuned because we're going to <laughs> schedule with him to come back to talk about his books. <laughs> but uh, today we're here to talk about, the, and, and Dan hinted about it earlier, about his Heinlein Juvenile Kickstarter that he's got going. So uh, first, let's start with what made you come up with uh, writing this book? Well, I, um, about, uh, the, well, the short answer is I sat down to write a novel and instead I started writing this book and it was very annoying. And so I had to write it fast so I could get it out of the way and write the novel I was scheduled to write. Um, the long version is when, uh, when I first saw the Starship Troopers film, I was stunned because although it was obviously a satire that was kind of trying to poke fun at the book, 
there was that moment at the end where we'll keep fighting and we'll win that really made the whole thing feel like Heinlein had written the script. And it startled me because that was, I just had this emotional flavor that I always got with Heinlein books, especially the juveniles that I'd never been able to find anywhere else. And to see someone else do it made me think, ah, there's a technique here and I need to learn what it is. And it faded mm-hmm. to the back of my mind for years um, until I was actually making an effort to understand what it was and write it. And I was in the middle of rereading the Heinlein juveniles. And when I was writing Suave Rob, my friend Gail Carragher started complaining to me that she'd written this uh, kid's science fiction book, but she couldn't sell it because she was brand new author and her agent only wanted steampunk stories from her. And I said, well, let me read it. And I read it and I, I had to scrape my jaw off the floor because it was a Heinlein juvenile. Whatever she had stumbled on was exactly what Heinlein was doing in the juveniles. And so I bought the rights from it. We crowdfunded a full cast audiobook version of it. And she asked me during that campaign, why did you do this? What was it about this book that got you? And I couldn't explain it, but I promised I would at some point. And at that point, I started making a serious literary study of the juveniles to find out how they ticked. When I thought I had it figured out, I wrote my book, Hadrian's Flight, and passed it off um, before publication to one of Heinlein's personal friends who gave me the, the blurb that's on the cover that's what Heinlein would be writing if he was alive today. Um, I had figured out what the formula was, and so I decided I was going to write the Heinlein Juvenile every couple of years because I just love the literary form. And when I sat down to write what was going to be my fourth one, I accidentally wrote the book about how they are so I could finally answer Gail's question because I still owed her an answer. So it's um, the book goes into depth on the literary traditions that the Heinlein Juvenile, well, first it makes the argument that it's a distinct literary form. And then it looks at the uh, traditions that, that, that it draws from and the elements that Heinlein brought that were personal and the elements that anyone could bring if they thought of doing it um, and tries to make the distinction between how much of this is Heinlein's voice versus a literary form he invented. And I go through each of the books and all sorts of other fun stuff. So here's my big thing. So, cause I work with Dragon Con on literature department. And we have mm-hmm. all different kinds, and we have YA. What what age group are we talking about when we talk about a Heinlein juvenile? Okay, so the Heinlein juveniles were the first speculative fiction young adult literature. Okay, but they are diff- They're distinct from today's. A, a juvenile is distinct from YA. It's a subset of YA, but it's distinct from it in that YA is any story that has a protagonist that's a late teenager, young adult, uh, or early adult who's looking to make their way in the world. But they're intended for reading generally by by general audiences, and they're typically read by adults in their 30s and 40s who are on a nostalgia kick, Mm -hmm. um, with very rare exceptions like the Harry Potter books that first appealed primarily to kids. But Harry Potter is technically shelved in the children's department when you go into Barnes & Noble. Right. So the first the first three Harry Potter books are middle grade and the second three are YA. Okay. Um, okay. The a juvenile is any YA book that is written to and intended primarily to be read by um, people who are the same age as the protagonist. Okay. As opposed okay. as opposed to just having a protagonist of that age. Okay. You hear that, Jr.? He could write a juvenile for you. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. You missed me, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I tell myself as I cry myself to sleep tonight. <laughs> all right. So. In all fairness, she probably lives far. She probably lives too far away from you for you to be accurate at that range. This is true. She is safe. I don't think anybody can. I guess I get like. A, like 12 hour drive from Newport News to Atlanta, I think. Um, I'm not telling. So, I don't know. I haven't pulled up Google to check. I don't so, know. I, didn't, I was never a lieutenant. I'm not that bad with math. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, anyway, so, uh, so do you have a favorite of his juveniles? 
Ooh, yes, yeah. yeah. It's um, it's got to be. It's a it's a real close tie, but it's got to be have spacesuit will travel. Ooh, that's my the citizen of the galaxy is is a close second. Though, though I will admit, I'm not sure it was meant as a juvenile, but I was the same age as the main character in um, the Menace from Earth when I read that. That they, I've got a section on the Menace from Earth in the book. I I actually uh, Hadrian's flight steals the concept from the Menace from Earth. Um, the the wing suits and whatnot, and uh, the main character works at a place called Bob and Ginny's Flying Suits. And, uh, and 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 designs them, and and the family business is giving flying lessons and whatnot mm-hmm. before his life blows up. So yeah, I, I really so, love the Menace from Earth. So with with that def- with, with that definition, Dan, um, I take it you're not including uh, Starship Troopers as one of the juveniles. Starship Troopers is um, right on the edge between being a juvenile and an adult book. It was obviously published as an adult book, but it was. He, when he started writing it, he was intending to write a juvenile, but it got away from him. Um, yeah. And especially when he realized that he could use it to get fired from Scribner's. There was a, a <laughs> long and really, really nasty saga between him and his editor, who was a devout Freudian and was convinced that every whimsical element he put into his stories was some kind of way to sexually program the children who were reading the books. <laughs> and so in frustration, he tried, he, and the, the contract were that he gave them one a year and they had, they had an option on the next one. So they had to actually reject a book for him to get out of the contract. Ah. And so by the time this, by the time the star beast rolled around, he was so livid that he took and he deliberately made deliberately laid all sorts of Freudian stuff into the star beast, basically made it into an elaborate dirty joke hilariously also made a really good story at the same time. But I mean, the, the main character's name is John Thomas, which is a Victorian word for penis. Um, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's got an Oedipal mother. There's all sorts of writing stuff all through it. And it passed without comment. So he wrote the book she'd been accusing him of trying to write. And then she, she, she published it without comment and then started fighting with him when he went back to writing stuff that wasn't loaded with dirty jokes. So, Starship okay. Troopers, he saw as his next opportunity to get out of the contract. And so um, once he realized that it was getting to be more adult, he amped up the adultness as a way to try to get fired and sent his agent in with instructions to, okay, when they reject that, go across the street. Um, and he did. <laughs> but in terms of its literary structure, it's still written it's still written in the form. Okay. So it's just more stru- for like and, a- and st- it's more like a for new, an older audience. Yeah, kind of like more like a new like, adult. Yeah, yeah, new adult versus YA. It's not. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I don't think it's as graphic as most new adult is incredibly graphic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah it's, and was, it, it's more adult, but not in a sexual way. It's uh, what he what he does with Starship Troopers is he actually brings in a new genre of literature, the Socratic dialogue, and he he does a Heinlein Heinlein juvenile as a Socratic dialogue. Um. And so it's a very interesting, weird blending of uh, of genres. So it's Socratic dialogue. So it's you'll have like, a, you mean like you'll have different characters taking different points and they're kind of playing off each other. With mm-hmm. uh, the kind of yeah, like, it's uh, uh, starting with last yeah, starting with last days of Socrates and then moving up through especially German medieval literature, which Heinlein was a huge fan of. Um, this the um, uh, or uh, Voltaire's Candide. Um, in French literature, there's this tradition in the Western canon of using adventure stories or um, high stakes situations as an excuse to argue about interesting ideas. Ah. Okay, yeah, yes. I've seen that. that sounds like and, so that's yeah, so that's the Socratic dialogue. So for it me, also sounds a lot like Citizen of the Galaxy because he's um, at least I remember the part where they were um, he's with kind of the space nomads and he's like talking with, and yep. learning about their culture. And so I can see him as an outsider playing off of them, asking the questions. About their so, everything. Yeah. Strange question. How mm-hmm. I, I've read a bunch of Highline, most of it, not the juvenile, but how much of his, would you say fell under the juvenile? There's the, like, uh, the 12, wise. there's the 12 that every, it's about a third of it. There's the 12 okay. that everybody agrees on. 
there's Menace from Earth. There's three other short stories that were published during his lifetime, but none of them really made a significant impact. Um, then there's kind of Starship Troopers and kind of, but not really, Podcane of Mars. Um, okay. So of the 30-odd books he wrote, that the ones that are both definitely and kind of add up to a little over a third of the oeuvre. But in terms of page count, of course, the later period, the World as Myth books, number, uh, uh, the World of Myth as Myth books, Friday, Job, um, oh, I, know I Will Fear No Evil. Counts. I read too much David Weber. The, they, are, they are really big. So in terms of the actual number of uh, published pages he produced, it's a much smaller section, but it did really influence the way the form he developed really did influence the way that his middle period adult literature plays out. So like uh, stranger in a strange land, uh, double star orphans of the sky um, to a lesser extent, door into summer, all pilfer from the formula or the form he developed for the juveniles and inflected them this way and that. So do you think as he was doing that, it was just, coincidence or was he trying to grow uh his stories with his audience like they did with the harry potter universe where it started as middle grade it became ya and then definitely became more adult as it went on was he intentionally trying to grow his stories as his audience grew or was it just a natural shift um, for other reasons yes but no it wasn't his audience that he was trying to grow his stories with it was the editors um he was convinced the audience could handle very sophisticated um, very philosophically sophisticated, literarily complicated adult type literature. His later period books are actually structured like symphonies and he gives it away in like Time Enough for Love where each, uh, each part is labeled with a movement type from a symphony so you can actually read it as a musical piece. Um, very uh, lot, lots of fractal design in the way the stories interconnect in his later books. And that's the kind of thing he always loved in uh, French and German literature and wanted to bring to American literature. But the editors told editors had this idea that Americans were simple minded and couldn't handle it. And so starting from the beginning of his short story his published short stories and moving all the way on. Um, you see him always trying to push against editorial tastes so that he can get to the kind of literature he really loves. And the development of the Heinlein juvenile form was one of the side effects of that push. The development of his later period epic form is another one of those. That's also a distinct literary genre, which I'll write a book on someday. And um, then there was uh, the, the ways that uh, sorry, lost the train of thought. But um, yeah, so he was doing that, but he was pushing against editorial tastes rather than, and trying to grow the editors up rather than trying to grow the audience up. Okay. So for me, of all the juveniles that he's written, Matt Dodson with the Space Patrol really spoke to me as a kid. Oh, uh, Space Cadet, Space Cadet. Yes. yes. I actually write all my newsletters and I address my audience as Space Cadet, like as, as a mm -hmm. nod to Heinlein. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, of course, Space Cadet spawned the Tom Corbett Space Cadet sort of empire that yep. was comics and whatnot. So given how much that one story uh, affected others, do you, and it was one of his first um, early uh, juveniles, do you feel like that one might be the pivotal one that, that affects the most of his of his push? Or do you think there's any other one that is more uh, impactful of, of all the juveniles that he's written? I could be biased uh, here because I want the answer to be yes. Do, do you mean impactful on the development of the form of the juveniles or do you mean impactful culturally? Both. I meant uh, the um, form of the juveniles, but I'll take gee, both. They are how to sound like a super fan. <laughs> I'm curious. I'm curious um, which one sold um, most. Um, I don't know which one sold most. Um, either on the initial runner and subsequent. I would probably. I would guess it would have to be Starship Troopers, just because the Naval Academy yeah. required it for so many decades, yeah. and because there was the the film adaptation. But um, in terms of the the juveniles, the pivotal one, the one where they finally found their form, was Space Cadet. Um, Rocket ship Galileo is very, that's the first one. It's very much, ob it's very obvious that he's trying to write a Tom Swift book, but that he's pushing at the limits of the form and he's not quite sure what he wants to do. And in Space Cadet, it it 
comes into focus what he's trying to do. And then Red Planet was, I believe, the third book. And that's where he nailed it. Um, in terms uh in terms of uh, cultural impact and literary impact beyond the, juve the Heinlein Juvenile Forum, despite Space Cadet getting all of that, in terms of its literary roots and whatnot, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a boarding school story. And those were really popular at the time. So there wasn't a lot that Very was... Very popular uh, now, that, too. Yeah. Yeah. There wasn't a lot new that he brought to the table in that sense. And so the boarding school genre went on as it until today as it did with not a lot of impact from Space Cadet. In terms of um, impact on the broader culture, it would have, the, the, I mean, the most influential would have to be Starship Troopers. Um, it was uh, required reading at, at one or more military academies all the way up until about six years ago. It uh, was one of the big, um, one of the big cultural turning points and part of the discussion on ending the draft. Um, mm. It was the, it was one of the first military SF books. It's the book that, cr that created the military SF subgenre as a distinct subgenre. Um, it, uh, it was the first, if I recall correctly, it was the first uh, science fiction book or really any book to portray women as officers in the military without yeah. any reservations whatsoever. I actually had an argument at KSU with a librarian about this because she goes, well, Heinlein was so sexist. And I went, no, Heinlein was the first person to put a female as an officer in uniform and have her be equal. Mm -hmm. It was not well, sexist. Yeah. Now, like by new now standards, it is. Because he only has them doing one thing. But at the mm -hmm. time, it was groundbreaking. And I'm like, we cannot mm -hmm. judge what was done yeah, then no. as groundbreaking without mm -hmm. acknowledging it was groundbreaking and we wouldn't have had the progress we've yeah. had without some of these things. Yeah. Have, have you seen uh, Heinlein's commentary on the moon landing? No. No. Mm -hmm. He makes Walter Cronkite very uncomfortable. Because in the midst of, of talking about the historical momentous, he says, now NASA made a really big mistake here. Because it they should have sent women astronauts. They're smaller, oh. they use less oxygen, they're, they, um, they take to the kind of command structure that they're using at NASA much more easily than men do. Men have to be beaten into it. Women make better astronauts, and NASA is wasting their time if they're trying to put men in the moon all the time. They need to put women up there. And Cronkite's looking at him like... You can't say that on TV. <laughs> <laughs> he actually was involved. I'm, gonna, but I'm not so sure I agree with that just because of the well, I think it I think it's true. Yeah, women women like those what he's saying is true, but in the nineteen in the nineteen sixties, I don't think I don't know I don't know if there were any really female test pilots were there. But yes, a lot there of were. the no, there weren't. Oh there were. Oh there, there were? were? There were. Uh, I mean I know oh, okay. did a thing on um on a on a woman who did during that time period did some. I think really? Oh, yeah. Could you send that to me offline? I would love to read or see that. Yeah, that is really uh, at least I think it was, she was at that time. It was the same time period, but there were women who were doing stuff. Crazy. Oh, stuff. Yeah, there were, there were test pilots. Certainly in the in the twenties and thirties, there were a lot of female test pilots, a lot of yeah. female hotshot pilots too. Well, I, yeah. I stand corrected then, because I I would think that the thing that is most valuable to the the original Moon crew, like the Apollo Eleven, was their experience with the test pilots, and also. Specifically, being able to react under stress in situations where no one's ever encountered this, and they can go forward with that. But if there were test pilots who were female at the time, yeah, no, that's that makes a lot of sense. I so, think women deal remarkably well under stress and sleep deprived, but that could just mm -hmm. be because I didn't kill anybody. Yet. Yeah, no. <laughs> so well, women have a much uh, much more gradual stress uptake curve too. So, like men go from zero to the maximum amount of stress where they lose fine motor control in forty seconds, and women take forty minutes. On the same well, adrenaline under the same stresses because of the different way that the uh, adrenaline system works in females versus males. And he actually because talks about that in having our children. He talks about mm -hmm. that in the Starship <laughs> Troopers, which is why there were so many naval pilots yep. that were women, whereas mm -hmm. so many of the men were the grunts, is because of the the spatial awareness. They actually talk mm -hmm. about that. Um, I will say he was also groundbreaking in not just the women uh, writing as women characters. Wasn't he the first one that had like a Filipino character in the form of Juan Riquez? 
with Starship Troopers. Mm -hmm. the main yeah, character. that he he's well, he snuck a lot of minority characters by the editors. Um, did uh, 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 Rod uh, Walker was a um, was black and practiced basically Persian monism, um, monist religion and Tunnel in the Sky. There was Juan Rico and Starship Troopers. Um, one of the main characters in Rocket Ship Galileo was not just Jewish, but religiously Jewish at a time when that was not something you were going to get away with in a children's book. Um, a lot of this, a lot of the supporting characters, it comes out incidentally after they've been on screen for a while that they're black or Hispanic or Chinese. He was really, really, he, he was on a bit of a crusade for many years and he fought battles with editors over that. But one of the interesting things I ran into on the sexism angle with this um, is part of this research. Um, I found out that he was part of a, a tangential part of the clique that included uh, Henry Miller and Anais Nin in the Age of Jazz and Edna St. Vincent Millay and that whole bit. And the version, so the 1920s version of what the ideal feminist woman is, is what... A, he married twice, and B, shows up as Heinlein's uh, female, uh, strong females through all of his books. And, you know, mm. as we've all been through two or three waves of feminism, we know that uh, last wave's feminist ideal is the next wave's regressive stereotype. <laughs> sure, I sure just enough. annoy all of them. That's what so, I tell everybody. One of the things that also, when he weighs in on the moon landing, that he, when he was talking about that, is is not as commonly known. He was actually part of the team on a government think tank that was designing the spacesuits. Um, yep. For NASA, and that's where where how spacesuit will travel was from a lot of his declassified research. Yep. So okay, but get, getting back to the juvenile, so we've just just yes. defined what it is that makes it particularly age specific. But what is it, Heinlein versus, say, um, Wings of Fire or uh, Ember City? Okay, so what um, what makes a Heinlein juvenile form? Uh, the Heinlein juvenile is a distinct literary form, is that it blends the Stratemeyer Syndicate sensationalist conventions. That's the Hardy Boys, Tom Swift, um, Boxcar Children, Nancy Drew. That um, that family of books blends that with usually a subverted form of the Horatio Alger formula with the hero's journey, with the heroine's journey, um, all riding on the back of a building's Roman. You put those five elements together and you add a sixth element, which I call the endless road, and you have what it takes to make a Heinlein juvenile. Okay. Um, those so I yeah. don't have a degree in literature. So some of those things okay. are a little bit beyond me and probably beyond some of our audience, maybe. All right, I'll give you a quick uh, so rundown. The, yeah, can we start with the top? Like I got some of the stuff about Nancy Drew and everything, but then okay. after that you start. All right, so, all right, so the Stratemeyer Syndicate was like um, late 19th century's version of James Patterson. It was a okay. whole bunch of authors that, that wrote under specific house pen names and then the final product was massaged by one guy. It was a liter okay. it was a it was a book factory. And they were hugely controversial at the time that they were first uh, writing because they they were writing what was called sensationalist literature. It's not what we call sensationalist now. It was it they meant it literally. It was focused on the sense experience and intended to excite the sensory experiences of excitement and um, okay. adrenaline. And that focus on the um, on the bodily sensual feelings that the literature was intended to evoke was thought to be a corrupting influence on children who needed to be learning um, self-discipline and uh, impulse control. Was this back before um, the TV Heinlein, set of course, was really ubiquitous? Like, yeah, kind of this like, was in the 1890s, 1910s. He was around, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is like kind of the way that we were like, oh, TV's horrible and corrupting it, you know, growing up there like that. They're right, like, oh, yeah, yeah, very awesome. much the same kind of way. So, Heinlein, of course, grew up on these books and loved them. Um, the next is the Horatio Alger story. We've all heard the the name, most of us have, and we think we associate Horatio Alger with by your bootstraps. You pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you become a you know, become a man and go off and conquer. But that's the one story Horatio Alger never wrote. 
Horatio Alger wrote basically versions of Pygmalion featuring gay boys. Um, Horatio, okay. Alger, Horatio Alger was a gay man who, who was also a devout Christian and a very proper Victorian who was really, really upset that there was no cultural script for how to be gay and good. And so he made it his mission in life to create one. And so in all of his uh, in all of his books, the main character is gay coded and is um, by dint of having a sterling character impresses a wealthy patron who takes pity on him and in, in gives him a leg up into society and teaches him how to behave and how to be successful, whether it's high political society or um, into the church or it's usually success in business of one sort or another. And so the Horatio Alger formula is the un is the uh, is the unearned benefactor. Okay. Thing. Um, Heinlein really loved the Horatio Alger books, but he thought that the storyline, the formula, was pretty silly, and so he usually subverted the formula by setting up the expectation that this was going to happen, and then when it happens, it's useless to the main character. Um, because he has, he's had to wait. Some mentors before. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so then we've got the hero's journey, which we all know from Star Wars. Um, there's the uh, the hero hears the call to adventure, refuses it, is forced to go anyway for one reason or another, either because the reward that it promises is irresistible, or because someone has wronged him and he has to get revenge. He goes out and he starts facing these trials and finding friends who help him become a better hero, but they all die off or abandon him so that he eventually has to face the final trial alone and he dies and then comes back to life and as a resurrected ascended being is able to integrate all the lessons he's learned and face down the ultimate evil triumph, get the boon, come home and in coming home, he bestows the boon upon his community and then realizes that he's not the same person he was when he left. And he either has to then go wander the world or he has to take on a different role in the community than the one that he was hoping to return to. This is Frodo and Lord of the Rings. It's Conan in the Conan books. It's Oedipus. It's, it's you know, it's the old... Real life. Yeah. Mm, very much real life. It's based on the... Uh, on the Bronze Age maturation curve, uh, the Bronze Age arc of life for men, and uh, with some solar mythology elements blended into it. The heroine's journey is from like the myth of Isis or um, Ishtar or Inanna. In the heroine's journey, something the heroine doesn't have any reason to go off on an adventure, but her home is ruined. And she now has to go and restore her home. So she goes off on a quest to restore her home. And on the way, she makes alliances with people. And one step after another, she um, accretes this team of dependable people around her. And at the end of the journey, she and the team together face down and defeat the bad guy and are able to restore the home to its previous glory or maybe even better and she can return to her original place and peace and tranquility is restored to the universe. Um, ancient ideas of, uh, of women as the builders and maintainers of homes combined with lunar mythology. And in the ancient canon, these were the two complementary pieces of a total view of humanity. Of course, we have more heroes' journeys than heroines' journeys that survive because most of the scribes were men and found the heroines' journeys less appealing. But we've got some of both. But you'll notice that these two, uh, these two journeys are completely inverted from one another. And most of the time when you try to combine them, you get either um, like adding a waveform to an inverted waveform, it flattens out and becomes nothing. Or you piss your audience off because you set them up to accept to expect one thing and you deliver something else and they throw the book against the wall. Um, Heinlein figured that. out... <laughs> <laughs> Heinlein figured out how to pull it off. And every one of the juveniles is a combined journey. Every, mo now, in most books now, you get a combined journey, but it's not one character's journey. You get two characters, like Frodo and Sam. Frodo goes on a hero's journey. Sam goes on a heroine's journey. Um, and you get that in a lot of buddy cop shows. But Heinlein figured out how to do both at once in one character. Say what? 
Sam is the one who stays home with him. He's the only one who doesn't. The only yep. one who doesn't uh, go back to the, the Undying Lands at the very end. Yep. So, and he gets the he gets yep. the, the wife and everything else. And he gets stayed home. So yeah. That's right. Have you, you done a podcast? With home. Have you done a podcast with Gail yeah. Gerard, character talking about the Heinlein stuff? Because I know she's really big on the uh, heroine's journey. Yeah, uh, no, I haven't done one talking with her about the Heinlein stuff yet. We'll probably do one of those later this year. Probably going to do Nanorama yeah. together again. But um, yeah. but it'd be interesting to yeah, hear okay, you so, about it. Yeah, oh, it would be fun. But uh, Heinlein figured out how to combine both these journeys in one character's arc, and that's part of the special sauce. <laughs> and then the Buildings Roman is a German form of literature. Um, that is concerned with the maturation of a teenager into an adult, specifically insofar as it's about the teenager mastering himself and learning how to fit himself into his culture, rather than carving out a space for himself, as is common in, say, American coming-age literature or um, English coming-of-age literature. It's uh, much more about finding a uh, finding a way to fit the square peg of you into the round hole of society without sacrificing who you are. Um, so that's the last of the major traditions. And then the one he brought to the table de novo is the endless road. And the trick's really simple. Every book ends on chapter one of book two. And the point, the point of that is that in real life, as opposed to the fairy tales, ha there's no happily ever after. You've just qualified for the next bigger set of problems. And every Why one of Heinlein's juveniles... Just described my life. <laughs> <laughs> every one of Heinlein's juveniles ends with the character having ascended to the next level and suddenly being out of his depth again. Even and have space that will travel, which was the last one, kind of hides it a little bit because it puts uh, puts it in reverse order with the endless road being the chapter before the end, and then the end being him defeating the bully that used to used to wail on him in high school. But um, every one of them ends with the character's feet set firmly upon the endless road. So he's the founding father of the cliffhanging bastard author society. <laughs> what you're telling no me. it's not a cliffhanger it's it's not designed to make you think oh i've got to have book two it's designed to make you th feel like oh okay now i know what i'm doing and i have to do this next thing it's meant to evoke a much more settled and mature form of acceptance that life is ongoing and complex and it doesn't end when the curtain falls hmm. I'm curious, Dan. Could you pick apart, like, pick one of the Heinlein novels and uh, Heinlein juveniles, and kind of go through it and really briefly, and kind of give us how it fits those five things? Um, sure. Uh, let's see which one would be. Okay, um, my favorite, my favorite Citizen of the Galaxy. Like, Citizen of the Galaxy. Uh, Citizen of the Galaxy's got a bunch of other stuff going on too, and I don't want to. That, that that'll take that'll take way I, I too think much. It can um, be really hard if. Well, I don't know. Maybe people don't need, need don't to worry spot, about yeah. spoilers. Oh, that's true. Yeah, okay. So this, yeah, so there will be spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> um, spoiler warning. Spoiler warning. Um, all the right, so let's do. Okay. Let me see if I can remember Farmer in this. Now I'll do Red Planet. I'm sure I can remember Red Planet well enough. I've read okay. them all a few hundred times, but you know, you write a book and then you sort of dump things from your memory so you've got room for the next thing. Um, okay, I can remember Red Planet well enough to do this, I'm sure. Okay, so Red Planet starts with um, uh, Jim Marlowe, who's a teenage kid on Mars who's about to go off to boarding school. He's got a little pet uh, Martian roundhead, which is like a fuzzy basketball with eyeballs that can come up and go down and can... Uh, can repeat anything that it hears. It's got an atonal diaphragm. So it's like a really sophisticated parrot. Jim, uh, Jim's father tries to convince him he can't take his, uh, his pet, the Martian roundhead Willis, to school because the rules say no pets. And 
Jim argues successfully that because Willis is was a free agent and followed him home and displays considerable independence that he's not a pet. He's just a member of the family, and so he takes him along with him. Jim's a real hothead. He's got a best friend who's much more even-tempered named Frank. They go to school having adventures along the way, exploring the... Um, exploring the Martian ruins, going where they're not supposed to, and accidentally becoming members of the tribe of one of the local Martian enclaves, um, because Willis introduces them. They get to boarding school, the first few months are great, and then suddenly they've got a change of command, and the new headmaster is a real prick. And he starts uh, immediately instituting like military barracks types inspections and demanding all sorts of formality from these frontier kids for whom it's not appropriate at all. It wouldn't even be appropriate in the city, but this is way beyond the pale. And the kids start talking about, about just going home, writing off school. Frank decides he's going to stick it out because he wants to be a pilot and he needs the degree. But D Jim doesn't need the degree, so he's like, eh, at the break, I'm just going to stay home. And then one night, after lights out, Willis decides that one of the records that Jim and Frank were playing earlier in the day sounded really cool, and at volume 13, he blasts the whole record across the dormitory, wakes everybody up, the headmaster comes in, super pissed off, and is, discovers that there's this Martian, confiscates the Martian, and... Um, just about gets into a life and death throwdown with Jim doing it. They, um, uh, he, the next day he's, um, he informs Jim that rather than letting him ship the Martian home, the Martian is an object of scientific curiosity and is going to, and is now officially the property of the school, especially since Jim said that he was his friend, not he was his pet. Um, so later that night, Jim and Frank go to break Willis out of the office and run home or break Willis out of the office and send him home and find that Willis has broken out on his own and has overheard a conversation between the headmaster and the guy who runs the colony. Um, Jim and Frank's parents are terraformers and they live at the South Pole during the Martian winter and they live at the North Pole during the Martian summer because uh, the climate's too extreme for them to live any one place year round, and they have to be at the poles to mine the ice and do the terraforming and everything. And the uh, overheard conversation, which Willis repeats verbatim, it turns out that the company has decided not to let, not to pay for the scientists to move anymore. They're just going to bring in new scientists so they can save the uh, transit costs and get twice the work out of everybody. Um, which, of course, puts everybody's lives in, in danger. So Jim and Frank sneak out the back of the school with Willis and head across country south uh, four or 5,000 miles on foot to get back home and tell everyone what's going on. And they get hunted along the way, and eventually they just about die in the desert, and they're picked up by a member of the Martian troop that they had joined earlier on. And they, the Martians then convey them back home after some stuff that's not really important to the plot, but very important to the character development. Um, Jim convinces his father that uh, of what's going on. Jim's father and the uh, and, and a friend of his organize an illegal move because it's now, now they're now all declared criminals. They move up to the equator where the boarding school is and um, discover their way has been blocked so they all hole up in the boarding school and they're beset with armed guards on every side until there's finally a battle and it all um, all comes out in the wash with the martians coming in at the very end on the side of the humans or of, of the um, scientists but only barely the martians want them off the planet and the only reason that they agree to let the scientists stay is because willis doesn't want to lose his friend jim so um, Willis goes off into hibernation in order to pupate into a Martian adult, because it turns out they're the same species. And um, everybody starts talking about what's going to happen after the next school year. So over the course of this Jim's uh, hero's journey, uh, he, he has both a full hero's journey and a full heroine's journey. The hero's journey involves learning to control and 
channel his aggression because he is a loose cannon at the beginning. He's very trigger happy, literally, because it's a frontier society and they've got dangerous animals. So everyone's going around armed. He's very rash and he's a dangerous person to be around, even though he's not malicious by the end. And, um, it, to the point where at one point when it's uh, he's threatened to be separated from Willis, he literally collapses kicking and screaming like a little child. And by the end of the adventure, he is much more circumspect and has earned quite a good deal of maturity along the way. But he also has a heroine's journey because his primary quest of saving Willis and then saving his parents he can't pull off. He's a kid. He doesn't have the power to do anything like that. When it comes to the final showdown in the battle, he, he and the uh, squad that he's going with are late to the party. By that time, the Martians have already come in. So it's Jim's alliances that he made along the way that mm -hmm. make the decisive move in the battle for Mars. It's not about him the, being a, the hero. It's about him making the right. alliances and the friendships. Making the the, yep, exactly. Um, the Martians are in play for the Horatio Alger element, except that he's not picked. So he's uh, he's adopted by Willis because he's an interesting and nice kid. And through Willis, he meets the Martians who are the ultimate benefactors. But it's subverted because the Martians don't like him very much. And they only let the humans stay on the planet as a favor to Willis. They think Jim is a bit of a prick. Um, and uh, so he is tolerated rather than adopted and civilized. Um, then, uh, and of course, the whole, th the whole thing has got, is full of sensational adventure, you know, palpable Martian landscapes. Uh, the one night they spend uh, in they spend a Martian night inside a giant cabbage, which uh, because they have flashlights provides enough oxygen for them to live through the evening, even though the air is too cold for their uh, breathing apparatuses to work properly. And um, every step along the way, you can smell the dirt, you can feel the danger. It's very much like a Hardy Boys novel. And then finally, all of it's riding on the back of the buildings, Roman. The story of the maturation of both of all three of the main characters, Jim and Frank and Willis, and them learning to get around their less noble um, characteristics without sacrificing who they are, learning to incorporate them as part of a fully developed human being instead of to be buttoned down and disciplined and suppressed or um, in, other, in other ways false, or on the other side, a, continuing to be a loose cannon that rebels for no really good reason at all. Yeah, it's very interesting. Wow. Okay, that's deep. And you break all this down in the, um, in the, uh, the novel? The, um... in, in much greater depth, and for each of the main 12 plus Starship Troopers, Podcane of Mars, and the Menace from Earth. Okay, very well, we've been at... We've got been at this for an hour, so before we pivot just a little bit, did you have any more questions, Joe? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think it's I think it's good. That's very interesting. Thanks. So we we mentioned before that this was a Kickstarter, and Kickstarters come with reward levels and perks and such. So mm -hmm. can you can you run us through not necessarily what they get because I think we've covered that and, and more, um, but can you tell us like as far as um, like what your levels are and what they can expect as at various backing levels that sort of thing. Yeah, just a sec. Let me run over there. Um, so at uh, five bucks, you can pick your favorite uh, Heinlein juvenile book and you'll get the chapter where I break it down as a chat book plus the introductory chapters that explain how the breakdowns work. Um, for 15 bucks, you get a special edition ebook, which is going to have a chapter or two appended to it that won't be available anywhere else for many, many years that um, examines how Heinlein used the juvenile formula in his early adult books um, to show how um, to show the possibilities of the form. Is this particularly geared for writers? Okay. Um, for thirty-five, you get the ebook and trade papers with the um, with the extras. For a hundred, you get a signed and numbered limited edition hardcover with uh, plus uh, the ebooks and the other extras. For 145, you get the 
paper, the ebook, and a uh, 90 minute Q and A or tutoring session with me for your book club or your homeschool group or whatever you want. And for 399, because I was too scared to put 400 up there, you get a <laughs> leather bound edition that is designed to look and feel like the Virginia Heinlein edition of Heinlein's books, it's specifically for people who have their Virginia edition and want this to sit next to them. Ah, okay. So, cool. and um, yeah, and on top of that, we've got uh, because we funded uh, we funded already, we're on to the stretch goals. And let me uh, pull those up because we've just passed one and we're coming up real close on number two. Um, Congratulations, by the way. So stretch oh, thank you. Yeah, stretch goal one was uh, workbooks. Uh, there's two workbooks, one for students and one for writers. And stretch goal th um, two is going to be a new book that I write on Heinlein's writing rules. I've been hosting The Everyday Novelist now for years and years and years, and I've seen just about every way someone can get creatively blocked. And the most difficult one of Heinlein's writing rules is you must not rewrite except to editorial direction. Everyone hates that one. Um, so this book is going to focus on, it's, I'm gonna pour basically everything I've learned about how different people with different sorts of creative blocks overcome them so that they can write good copy sort of the first time through. Um, and then uh, if we blow past this one, we've got an audiobook in the future. And then if this goes really to the moon, the secrets of the Heinlein epic will be the final stretch goal. Nice. Wow. Okay. And how long is this running? Um, and and I'm and I'm and I'm jumping and I'm dropping bonus uh, bonus gifts on the on the patron or on the backers because they've been fantastic. So um, there's a bunch of extra rewards you don't get to find out about until you back it. Ooh. Wow. Okay. So how That's many how more good. days? Uh, let's see how many is uh, probably 25 when does or 20 this wrap up actually would be a probably it, better uh, okay, yeah that's right uh it wraps up october 6th okay and, it, and this will be airing so, on the 20th so they'll have plenty of time to go in there and and back it excellent excellent come join me www.heinleinsecrets.com that goes to the kickstarter page all right that'll be well, awesome one last, uh, one last time for you, Joe. Did you have any questions about the Kickstarter itself that you wanted to ask before we wrap it up? No, this looks like a really interesting Kickstarter. It's really good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dan, was there anything we didn't ask you about the Heinlein Juvenile or this Kickstarter that you wanted to, you wanted to throw at us before we, we close it? <sighs> Nothing springs readily to mind. Did you have Not anything seen. else you wanted to add me before you close it? Uh, no, I was. I mean, we could nerd out off forever because I, you know, like I do. I, <laughs> I mean, we could probably talk for another hour about the Heinlein rules. I, mean, I but, need uh, to go to sleep. Yeah, I know. I need to get to going too. And, and there's you, a certain you are beginning the phase of never sleeping. <laughs> never sleeping. So <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, there there are whole sections of having a newborn where it's like it happened. That was a thing. Wow. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> hashtag things I will not do again. <laughs> so, so Joe, you've been an amazing co-host. Thank you for joining the conversation. Uh, so yeah. before we wrap this up, can you tell listeners if they enjoyed your takes on things? Uh, and you've been on the podcast before, but can you tell them where they can find you online? Oh, you can find me online. I'm, you, uh, I have a blog. Uh, my blog is 1001 Parsecs. I believe the link will be there. I don't blog as much very often, but you can find uh, my, all my books up there and um, also sign up for a newsletter. That's really how I do most uh interacting and, and you can also email me contact me if you want um i don't really do a whole lot of social media nowadays um i've kind of been cut that out for the last two years and it's it's, it's helped uh keep a lot of sanity to be honest um but i do um i do do, do respond pretty uh pretty well to emails and and a newsletter is the best way to follow me outstanding and all of the newsletter his website uh, his him on amazon will be uh, linked in the show notes, and I believe you are wide. So if you prefer Barnes and Noble for your, was it Nook, right? Mm -hmm. Doc, here's Nook. I also yes. do. Um, I also sell my books uh, on my website. I've been setting up my online author bookstore and 
getting that going. Um, so if you if you want, if you uh, are on BookFunnel, um, I use BookFunnel to uh, deliver the books. So if you already have an account there, that should be pretty easy. Um, but yeah, I'm also on Amazon. I'm on basically anywhere they'll let me to, they'll let me sell my books. So um, one of these days, I'm going to figure out how to sell books with, with Bitcoin, and then that would be uh, that would be great. Oh, I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> yes, our, I'm sure there's a system set up, but it's mostly for porn probably right now, which my books are not. So. Depends on who you ask, because apparently your mother with yeah. that three-star review. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there, there was my I, mom. So. I've got okay. one. I've got one for you, Joe. I had um, two of the first two po uh, novels I podcast were both full cast adaptations, and I'm not exactly shy when it comes to writing sex and violence. So I warned my parents, don't okay. listen. <laughs> My mother took me very seriously, so promised she wouldn't listen, and my dad said, yeah, yeah, fine. And then three weeks later, I got a call from my dad excoriating me for, for just <laughs> doing things in such poor taste. Four years later, I found out that my mother had listened to both of them multiple times and <laughs> found, them, <laughs> found them somewhat uncomfortable, but kept listening okay. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had one um, illicit scene in my first novella to set up the potential for my main character to have kids later. And so I wasn't trying to make it like erotica levels of sex scene, but just enough that people knew what happened. And Seska's heard this before. That's why she's laughing. Uh, on the edits I got from my mother who was doing the first line editing for me was, I don't know what you and your wife are doing, but go back and practice and then rewrite this scene. <laughs> so that was the end of that for me. Oh, nice. There you go. All right. And, uh, and so Joe, what are you, uh, what are you working on writing right now? So I just finished writing, uh, I've got several trilogies I'm finishing up. Uh, I just finished the uh, Genesis Earth trilogy writing it. It should be out. Um, it should be, it should be coming out in November. Um, it may be up for pre-order by October, probably not. Well, um, it'll probably be the end of October when it's up uh, for pre-order. Um, and other than that, I've, I'm putting out a lot of short stories these days. Uh, a lot of short. I've been experimenting with um, like all my short story. All my short story singles are free. Um, I keep them up for, until I have enough to put together for a collection. Then I publish the collection and take the singles down. But if you want to try out my writing, you can uh, pick up any of my short stories. I've also got um, a few other uh, prequels and first and series. I actually just created a page on my website. It's uh, the Bassacheck Free Library. So it's got all the stuff I have that's permanently free, and it's, it should be up there. Um, that's a good way to check things out. All right. And uh, what about you, uh, Dan? How can listeners find you on the Wild Wild Interwebs? And as usual, everything will be linked in the show notes. Um, you can uh, find all my books on anywhere fashionable books are sold, but uh, you can get the definitive collection at jdsawyer.net, um, as well as all the audio books that I've produced, including ones that I don't, uh, that I didn't write. Um, you can get my daily podcast for writers at everydaynovelist.com and you can follow my uh, substack at jdanielsawyer.substack.com where I'm basically roughing out a book on geopolitics and the hinge point in history that we're at right now exploring all the different elements that are in play is that the uh, book you're working on now um that's one of the books I'm working on right now the next fiction book that I'm working on Assuming that uh, I don't get dilute, I don't get buried by this Kickstarter with so many nonfiction books that I have to put fiction off for a while, is going to be a book about a, um, a science fi science fiction book about an immortal who has been kicked out of the Immortals Club because he um, thinks it would be a good idea to tell other people how to become immortal and the rest of the immortals don't. All right, that sounds interesting. Yeah. You sounds like one of my us. theories. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. You can find us, dear listener, on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters, tack and tack blades. Anchor.fm backslash blasters, tack and tack blades. You can follow us on Twitter at SF underscore fantasy underscore show. Sierra Fox Trout underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email us at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. We promise we do answer. So far, we've got a whopping total of three emails, and two of them were hate mail for Elvis. <sighs> Nobody's perfect. Uh, but again, you know, blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can join us all of the shenanigans on our Facebook group at facebook.com backslash groups backslash Blasters and Blades podcast. This is where Saskia and I incessantly argue about the merits of pineapple on pizza. Newsflash, she's wrong. You're wrong. 
facebook.com backslash, <laughs> backslash the Lasters and Blades podcast. You can support the show at buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put in the comment section that it's for the podcast. Again, that's buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. And if you put it in the comment section that it is for the podcast, Good. I promise I will keep Doc Seska and Nick Garber duly intoxicated. They will drink until their liver surrenders. Never quit. Never surrender. <laughs> Uh, with more enthusiasm next time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I have uh, no voice. I went to Dragon Con. Fair, fair enough. And you can also support us over there on the website, anchor.fm backslash blasters tag and tag blades for as little as 99 cents a month. And that does help defray the cost of keeping the lights on. So we appreciate all of you that are. Uh, and Doc, it's time for you to bring it home. And then I'm going to see if I can beat you out with a uh, excoriation on your pizza taste. JR, you, you will lose. Thank you for spending time with your, some of your precious time with us for the absentee overworked Nick Garber, the insane J.R. Handley. I'm Seska. This was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of picking on J.R. nerd cu culture, cheesy jokes, all things that go boom. <laughs> and of course, not allowing J.R. to talk about how pineapple on pizza is evil because he is wrong. It's delicious. <laughs>